Hello and welcome to the Apologetics 315 podcast with your hosts Brian Auten and Chad Gross. Join us for conversations and interviews on the topics of apologetics, evangelism, and the Christian worldview. Try to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Brian Auten and I'm here with Chad Gross. Greetings, Chad. Hello there. How's it going? Great, great. Yeah, so a uh, cool thing uh, this week was, um, uh, you ever heard of the band 21 Pilots? Of course. Yeah, well, they released a new album, and we were, me, when I say we, I mean me and the kids, me and the fam, have been into their music for some time. So the new album dropped, along with a live video stream experience concert. And I have to say... Oh, yeah. It was... It was the coolest thing I've ever seen. Music video. It was not like a music video, but it was like a one hour production. And it was just awesome. Wow. I don't know if anybody's into 21 Pilots that are listening, not hawking their merchandise or selling their CDs or anything or saying that they're, they're the, the best thing ever. But uh, I happen to like it. It's a two man band. The other dude's a drummer. One's a singer with amazing talent. But man, that that video was awesome. So that was the cool thing for this week. I stayed up late for the live streaming experience, and it was really cool. Excellent. I had a much different experience this week. I wanted to share this with you. So you know how in past podcasts we've talked about um, just etiquette on uh, Twitter and etiquette on social media and how to interact with believers and unbelievers in a thoughtful way, in a civil way. And both of us are big proponents of civility. Um, and I always try to put like little thoughts out there and kind of the Twitter verse in order to promote that, you know? Yeah. So I tweeted this week on May 20th, 2021, I tweeted this. If you have a good argument, why resort to personal attacks? So, you know, that seems pretty benign, and right? you got attacked. Pretty, <laughs> it seems like. Oh, my gosh, man. Listen to some of these replies. OK, and yeah. most of these people I have never interacted with before. So so here's what we get when you demonstrate no knowledge of science, history, literature or logic. Your arguments tend to just be annoying. If God is so great, why did he screw up his creation so badly that he had to murder all but eight people so he could start over? And they were still so bad that he needed a blood sacrifice from kind of sort of himself to save the people he created from the rules he created. Um, now, mm. other people were a little bit more, you know, honest and just said, honestly, it's just from frustration and things like that. And they were very honest, but it was amazing to see the replies uh, that I got. Listen to this one. Christian apologetics, a process designed for believers to reinforce that. What they believe is not crazy. It is the perfect scam, a huge, gullible, and often affluent audience that believes most everything they are told based on their feelings rather than reality. Hmm, Man, it'd be fun to unpack these at some point. Oh, my gosh. Interesting. interesting. Because, you know, they are they're they're really short. But man, it's like they're loaded with with implications and and ideas and stuff that would be really interesting to to think about because there's certain bit of truth in there and then it's twisted and it doesn't apply to everybody and some you know i can see where people would think those things yeah there were there were there was another like conversation that i had i tried to to engage some of these people but um it was very difficult because they were really just interested in kind of either questioning my motives and assuming that i was kind of this underhanded person uh there were a lot of people that just said that you know they kind of I wasn't, I I mean, honestly, I can say this. I mean, the Lord knows my heart and there's a lot of people that, you know, don't know me, you know, on here, but I was honestly just trying to say it was toward everybody. I I didn't mean this like toward atheists or toward Christians. It was just like, Hey, and there were so many people that came back and said things like, well, that's why I never have conversations with creationists or that's why I never have conversations with Christians or apologists. You know, and yeah, we need to do better, but it was just, it was interesting to see how I put something out there that I thought like, wow, this is something everybody can agree on, you know, that if you have a good argument, why resort to personal attacks? And man, oh day, 
I was just taken to the woodshed. And I mean, I'm at a point now where these these don't like personally upset me or offend me or anything. I get yeah. it that people are just sharing their thoughts, but it was just very telling of kind of the um, kind of the atmosphere of Twitter sometimes oh, man. where I feel yeah. like I could put I could put out there. The sun is bright and uh, people would come at me. Yeah, you, you, you know what I mean? Like, uh, it's just it was very interesting because I really just did mean if you have a good argument, there's no need for personal attacks. Let's just talk about the arguments, you know? Yeah. And, you know, those uh, people are so stupid. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right, man. So that take that, you big dummies. Anyway, I just thought that yeah. was super interesting. And hey, I love that idea of kind of unpacking some of those claims, but also. You know, we've said before that as apologists, we freely admit that we need to do a better job as far as as a whole, as communicating with grace and truth and, um, you know, not taking it personally and, and making it about the argument and not about, yeah. you know, being angry or being right. We're trying to win the man, not the person. We, we've talked about all that. Yeah. And that was really yeah. my heart and sharing it. But uh, it was amazing how my motives were, you know, called into question. And uh, so, yeah, I just thought that was really interesting and, and kind of indicative of the atmosphere sometimes on Twitter. I will say that I appreciated the people who just came out and said, look, I do it because it's fun. You know, like they were honest, like they did. They didn't try to say, you know, they didn't try to, like, justify what they were doing. They're just like, because it's fun. And I mean, obviously, I don't agree with that, but at least they were willing to say, hey, I, I do it because I enjoy it. What is that? It's a plane. What's it doing here? I think it's a mail plane. Yeah, so Chad, guess what happened? Uh, we got an email, uh, podcast at apologetics315.com. Oh. Uh, usually it's just like spam, like SEO services saying that they can fix my website, which has missing keywords. Right. But today. Right. Uh, all the ones asking why you've brought Chad Gross on board and can you please remove him from the podcast, but you stick with me because you're a good friend. Yeah, so it says... I just wanted to say that I am jo I'm enjoying your podcast just for fun. Put your podcast on 1.5 speed. Brian sounds like an AI voice. Back off, man. I'm a scientist. So that was Lance. Lance, thank you. Uh, I, that is so flattering. Um, yes, I, I, that's why I go for two times speed. Uh, it just sounds really great. <laughs> When you go for two times speed, do you sound like British or something? I'm just, I'm just no, curious. No. I, I think this is actually a compliment because, you know, they only pick the best voices for these AI oh, oh. things. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for the feedback, Lance. Just glad that you're enjoying the podcast. We'll do something at, you know, 1.6, 1.8 speed with some like hidden lyrics, you know, play it backwards. Whoa. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. So I'm also excited about um, today's guest, Ken Samples. He's been with us before, so I'm excited to have him with us again. The reason he keeps coming back is because I like this guy. He's no stranger to the podcast. He's a Christian philosopher, theologian, and apologist, Ken Samples. He's a senior research scholar at Reasons to Believe and the author of a whole pile of books, Christian Endgame, Seven Truths That Changed the World, God Among Sages, the one we talked about a couple years ago, Classic Christian Thinkers. And today we're talking to Ken about his newest book, Christianity Cross-Examined. Is it rational, relevant, and good? Mmm. Uh, so I'm looking forward to this, uh, Chad. Um, are you ready for this interview? <laughs> yes, I am ready for this interview. I'm looking forward to it. Always appreciate. I've been following Sample's work for a long time. I think he's a clear communicator. I like that he is uh, thorough in what he presents, but he's also very humble uh, in his apologetic in the sense that he's just trying to demonstrate that Christianity is rational to believe. He's not trying to overwhelm you with every jot, tittle, and piece of evidence that he can find. Let's go to the interview. Let's get ready. Switch me on. Welcome to the podcast, Ken. It's great to have you back. Thank you, Brian. It's a pleasure. Every time you come on, we're talking about some new book you've written, so you're very prolific. Uh, can you tell our listeners just a bit about what you're working on these days and what keeps you busy and what you're seeing in apologetics today? Yeah, very good. Well, again, thanks for having me on. Um, I'm on the scholar team at Reasons to Believe, and 
I'm a bit of an oddball there because I'm one of the non-scientists. My next project in terms of writing is I'm going to I'm going to work on a book on logic and critical thinking, kind of a a primer mm. for for people who want to improve their logic and critical thinking skills. So that's kind of the project I'm looking forward to. I am uh, toying with the idea of some kind of book that may look at the Trinity from the standpoint of, of because God has plurality of personhood within the one nature, that he can be a perfect God vis-a-vis -vis traditional Judaism and Islam. So those are some of the writing projects I'm working on. And of course, I have a podcast and write regular articles. So keeping busy. Well, please write the critical thinking and logic book. <laughs> <laughs> Chad and I have talked about this. Uh, you know, if there's anything we could do to help the church generally, it was always, it's, it's for me, it always comes back to if we could just help people to think better, give them thinking toolkits so that they could spot all the fallacies and sort of like uh, do some proper hermeneutics and like, you know, weigh things and not just swallow everything. So I love that. I hope I hope that comes first before the Trinity book. <laughs> well, we definitely love to have you back on to talk about that book for sure. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that in my 30 plus years of teaching, it's always the logic and critical thinking class that students come back to me and say, you know, this class has empowered me. I I can discern, I can reflect. And so I've always enjoyed teaching it. And um, I, I certainly think our churches can use it. So mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. we're going to be talking to you about your latest book, uh, Christianity Cross-Examined. And so if you want to just talk to us about why you've written this book, I mean, we're, we've been looking forward to it in the, in the aspect of when we spoke to Fuzrana, he was saying that, you know, the thing that you're seeing is that there used to be more questions about, is Christianity true? And that seems to be shifting about, well, is it good? Is it helpful? And, uh, you know, there's a cultural shift and then people asking different questions and things like that. So let's hear it from you, what your uh, goal is in writing, how you formatted the book and what you're seeing. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, when I would, if I go back to when I first started doing apologetics in a professional context, like the 19, late 1980s, and I hosted the Bible Answer Man program, when I would go to the academy in those days, giving talks sometimes to faculty, often to students, the kinds of questions I got were very much truth questions. Uh, does God exist? Can we look at the traditional arguments for God? Is Jesus the Son of God? Was he raised from the dead? However, as I moved forward and my time at uh, Reasons to Believe, I would say about 10 or 15 years ago, I began to notice that there was a real change in the kinds of questions that I got. It's not that I don't still get truth questions, but I would say in the last decade, uh, I get a lot more questions about whether Christianity has been a good force in the world. And so people are very interested, uh, maybe less in truth, goodness, and beauty, and may maybe more interested in race, gender, and class, for example. So people will raise questions like whether Christianity has been good for minority groups or for women. And of course, there were questions that I think really kind of came out of the, um, the new atheism about the, about the nature of Yahweh in the Old Testament, the morals of the Old Testament. That came through. Right. So I, I thought to myself, uh, maybe, maybe what we need to do is uh, to address both. Uh, and if if I could say, um, if I were to think about two types of atheists, now, maybe these are more models or paradigms than easily fitting particular atheist here, but I, I have encountered two types of atheists. One atheist, I think, would say something like this. They would say, look, you know, it may not be a bad idea if God existed. Maybe that would mean I would uh, be reunited with my family members. Uh, maybe, maybe you know, I mean, naturalism as a worldview is uh, pretty bleak. But there's no there's no good reason to believe that God exists. Um, I'm not sure if Graham Oppie would fit that pattern just right. 
But I know that Graham Oppie, for example, an Australian philosopher, he would say it's just impossible that God existed. So he's not willing to kind of entertain questions about whether it'd be a good thing. On the other hand, I think maybe a Thomas Nagel would fit into the second category, and I would describe it this way, that I think somebody like Tom Nagel would say, no, there is a rational basis for Christianity. In fact, Nagel is close friends with Alvin Plantica and some of the leading Christian thinkers. I think it, I've heard him say, it bothers me that such bright people believe in God. But I, but I know that Nagel would respond, but uh, I don't want that God to exist. And I, and I thought in light of those two, you know, whether Nagel and Oppie fit perfectly, if you think about that kind of model, I thought to myself, maybe I could write a book that would address both the truth and the goodness question. I, I think maybe we ought to continue to make our case that Christianity is reasonable, but maybe also remind people as to why it may be a good thing if it were indeed true. So that. That kind of shaped mm. my thinking about this book. That kind of reminds me of uh, Pascal saying that uh, first show people that it's uh, something good and then show them that it's true, if I'm quoting that correctly. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, I think if you reflect about truth, goodness, and beauty, uh, maybe we have people today uh, who have kind of moved from maybe a modernist mindset to a postmodern mindset. So maybe they need to be reminded that Christianity is a good thing. And then maybe we can circle back to the truth of the issue. So in talking about how these questions have changed, and I mean, I've been a Christian, I'm 44 now. I've been a Christian since I was 25. And even I've seen that shift. Uh, and so I completely understand where you're coming from. And, and I know this answer is, is multifaceted in the sense that you can't always point to one direct thing. But but why do you think that that change has occurred? What do you think has um, contributed to that? I know you mentioned the new atheists, for one thing, but are there other things that you think may have contributed to kind of that shift in, in questions that are being asked? Yeah, that's a good question, Chad. I, I always thought that postmodernism was just kind of a minority view. Maybe it was held, you know, by gray-haired old uh uh, faculty members in, in colleges and universities. But I have to tell you, the the year of the pandemic kind of woke me up to the idea that I think postmodernism is here and it's here to stay. So I, I think that there has been a shift in that kind of context. And so, I mean, what is characteristic of postmodernism? Well, a deep suspicion about things like objective morality, about objective truth claims. So I, I think those, I, those ideas kind of come forward. I also do think, and I, I talk about this briefly in my introduction of, of uh, Christianity Cross-Examined, I, I think to some extent the, the new atheists frame the issues this way. I mean, I was watching a debate recently. That this debate goes back a number of years because Hitchens has now passed away, but Hitchens debated Alistair McGrath, and Alistair McGrath is just a brilliant man. I think he's got three PhDs, all from Oxford University. <laughs> um, you know, anytime he speaks, I listen. But I actually thought that Hitchens was so skilled at rhetoric, at ridicule, satire, that McGrath was more gentlemanly. And I, and I thought to yeah. myself, you know... Uh, this isn't this isn't unlike what Socrates encountered with the Sophists 2,500 years ago, and so as much as I think maybe postmodernism is new, it may not all be that new. But I I think there's a variety of things, and I certainly think postmodernism has led people to be suspicious about broad truth claims or or claims about objective morality. Yeah, I'm th I'm thinking of in um uh. The philosopher John Mark Reynolds, he he wrote a book with the late Philip Johnson. It's something I think it was called Against All Gods. And uh, he mentions in there how he was watching the William Lane Craig, Christopher Hitchens debate and how when it comes to logic and argument, uh, William Lane Craig demolished Hitchens. But to the uneducated person who's not familiar with the arguments and you're just watching the debate, 
uh, the rhetoric is so powerful of Hitchens that you can walk away thinking, wow, he, he you know, those rhetorical flourishes just just really stick with people, you know, uh, and because we're not we're not a culture as much anymore that values logic and reason and evidence, um, that rhetoric can really go a long way to in, in influencing yeah. people. Yeah, I mean, when I was studying philosophy, I studied what I would call the old atheists. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, Jean Paul mm. Sartre, uh, J. L. Mackey, and what I what I think is interesting in contrasting what I'm going to call the old and the new atheists is A. J. Eyre would be another the analytic British philosopher. I I think the old atheists are a lot more formidable because of a couple things. One, they gravitate toward arguments, but I think all of the old atheists also knew Christianity, uh, I think largely because they had to study it. Christianity held sway in their day. So they knew some of the soft underbelly. I mean, Nietzsche would rhetorically say, well, if you want me to believe in your Redeemer, why don't you act a little more redeemed? He knew that hypocrisy is a challenge. But to move to the new atheists, I, I completely agree. I was at the uh, Hitchens Craig debate at Biola University and I think it was 2009. What what I think all of these new atheists, uh, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchin, Richard Dawkins, Dan Dennett, but I would throw some others in the camp. Uh, Jerry Coyne, the American scientist, Peter Atkins at, at Oxford. I think they are very good at kind of selectively picking things in church history and making them look really, really bad. Hmm. So you know, Augustine was the great rhetorician. Maybe we need to teach people not just logic, but maybe rhetoric as well. Yes, please write that book, Logic and <laughs> Rhetoric, uh, for, for today's Christian apologist. Oh, that would be great. Seriously. Yeah. Well, you know, the first, we want to talk about the first part here. And one of the things that we're separating the book into from into two parts. Is it true? And then is it good or useful? So let's talk about your approach. Um, you list various arguments for the existence of God, for instance, and in there you talk about a cumulative case. So, for instance, you've got the resurrection and you choose 20 facts about that. And then you say, well, here's a cumulative case. So talk about why that is helpful in your view, and we'll go from there. Yeah, I, you know, in teaching logic, I, I, I think that you could describe three types of reasoning or three types of arguments, uh, deductive, inductive, and abductive. Deductive arguments, when they're done properly, when they're valid and sound, you end up with, with certainly true conclusions, which is wonderful. The problem, however, is that they have limited application, so you have to be very selective and careful in making a deductive argument. Induction is very popular, particularly in the sciences. And if you if you do induction properly, you have uh, you end up with cogent uh, conclusions, which means that they're probably true. However, there are limitations to probability arguments. A less known way of thinking and reasoning is known as abductive reasoning, and it doesn't have anything to do with UFOs where they abduct you. I always have to say <laughs> that these days. Oh, man. Um, especially right now. Right. Especially <laughs> right now. That's, that's correct. Abduction can be thought of in two ways. Some logicians see it as kind of a secondary form of induction, but I don't. I see it as kind of a distinct third category, and that's where you reason... Uh, to plausibility, not to probability, not to certainty, but to plausibility. And anyone who engages in what I would call diagnostic reasoning, you know, when I go to my doctor and, you know, I have a health challenge, I mean, he develops a diagnosis and he looks at my family history, he looks at uh, my symptoms, you know, and he develops this diagnosis as, as to what it may be that's, that's ailing me. It seems to me that very thoughtful people in life gravitate toward abduction. Uh, we're always looking for the best explanation of something. Uh, doctors do it. Historians do it. Attorneys do it. My father, who was an automobile mechanic, I remember when I was a boy, 
he would tune up a neighbor's car and they'd pull the dr the car into the driveway. And my dad would open the hood and just listen to the engine for a few minutes and then tell him what was wrong. And I thought, my dad is a shaman. He is a <laughs> spiritual master. I mean, who could, who could listen to a, a car engine and tell you what was wrong? Well, my dad wasn't a shaman. My dad knew something about the internal combustion engine, and he realized that engines were, they gave symptoms just like a body would to a doctor. So uh, abduction is inference to the best explanation. And as I have read some of my favorite Christian thinkers, C.S. Lewis would be one of them, uh, Lewis develops kind of an abductive, best explanation type of reasoning. And I like it for a number of reasons, Brian and Chad. Um, I like it because many logicians think it's the most natural way that people think. I mean, if you're sleeping in on a Saturday morning, you take a peek through the blinds, you see the street is wet immediately you search your mind, what's the explanation? You know, it rained. I also like it because I think it fits Christianity very well. It's kind of Lewis's idea that I see the sun, but I not only see the sun, I see everything else because of the sun. And I think that that's a very powerful way of reasoning. And I also think it allows other people uh, it allows me to say to other people, I'm not saying your worldview doesn't have some explanatory power. And it, and it means, it also means, however, that these arguments probably don't prove as much as maybe some of the deductive arguments do. I mean, one critique would be maybe you end up with a bunch of leaky buckets. But mm. I, actu yeah. I actually think that from a logical point of view, it's a very powerful way. And I can also allow the Holy Spirit to, to do his work in light of that without concluding that people have to kind of give in, logically speaking. Yeah. I'm thinking there, Ken, and you know how some people might accuse the Christian of using apologetics as just a way to confirm their beliefs. And I can see maybe where they're coming from. But for me, when I started studying apologetics, at the beginning, if you would have asked me, well, why do you believe in God? I would have been more along the lines of, well, it's just obvious. But if someone said, give me reasons, I would have to kind of start thinking about the reasons. And it's not as if I was unreasonable in my belief, but more like, like you said, I just kind of listened to the engine <laughs> of my experience and like, well, I, I can tell for a whole bunch of reasons now, if you started quantifying, well, don't you think look things look designed? Don't you think there's a moral order? That's what, when I studied apologetics, it was almost like, ah, here's all the reasons that I've been hearing this whole time. But I just didn't, I couldn't put that into words. So for me, I think apologetics in one way is just a way to sort of show you what you're already seeing mm -hmm. so that you can communicate it rationally or logically or intelligibly, because maybe a lot of Christians just they, of course, they've had an experience with Jesus and they would agree with you about, say, design and stuff, but they wouldn't be able to articulate that. So I think that apologetics helps people to articulate it in a, in a good way and, and sort of reveals to them what's sort of behind in the foreground. Does that make sense? <laughs> makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, I remember philosopher Peter Kreef said that, um, you know, in the ancient world or in the medieval world, uh, most people thought, Belief in God was just common sense. Well, we mm. don't live in the ancient or medieval world anymore, but I mean, I think if I were, if I were pressed to say, uh, what is the fundamental reason that you believe? I, I think I would gravitate toward kind of an abductive, cumulative case and say, you know, God seems to make sense of the most meaningful realities, not only in the world, you know, that the universe seems to have had a beginning, that it's fine-tuned, that humans can track the intelligibility of the universe. But when I look in the mirror, I seem to be a prime candidate for original sin. Um, <laughs> my life seems to be broken and fallen the way the Bible depicts. So I think it is a powerful way of reasoning it. And I think Christianity does a really good job of ex the... Um, the scope of explanation uh, that comes with it. And so you mentioned Pascal, that humans are great and wretched. I, I think that's right. 
I think humans are exceptional creatures. We can do science. We can do philosophy. We seem different in kind, not in just degree. But yet humans are so deeply flawed. I mean, you don't have to know me very long to realize, wow, Ken is flawed. In my view, I don't think uh, Eastern mysticism or even naturalism does that good a job. Uh, Hugh Ross, uh, the president of Reasons to Believe, he often says that humans are both better and worse than, than he thinks they would be if we're the product of purely naturalistic evolution, that we seem mm. greater and mm. more broken. And so I think that is a, a very powerful way of reasoning. Again, I admit that there are, you know, when you're talking plausibility, you're not talking certainty. But nevertheless, uh, I mean, we, we try cases based upon this type of reasoning. Doctors make diagnoses in this way. Historians look at these kinds of things. So I, I, I find it very, very powerful. So in, in thinking about, you know, you present a number of arguments for the existence of God in your book. And I'm wondering, one of the kind of popular objections that I see online, and, and I thought when I knew we were interviewing you, I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity to run this by uh, Ken Samples and see what he thinks. And, and it kind of goes something like, you know, people argue if, if God really existed, we, we wouldn't need arguments. So, so in other words, if, if he really existed and, and he had the attributes that were most commonly that, that we most commonly attribute to him, his existence would be more obvious that we wouldn't need arguments at all if he really existed. What, what would be your what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think you're touching on what uh, philosophers would call the, um, the hiddenness of God. That if, I mean, uh, right. Schellenberg, the Canadian philosopher, says that if God is all powerful and if he is completely benevolent, uh, he would want to introduce himself to everybody. Uh, he would want to make himself known. And yet there is what Schellenberg calls uh, this unbelief, this, this, uh, trying to think of the exact term he uses. Uh, but, but I think that's an interesting argument. I don't think it's persuasive for a couple reasons, Chad. I think, um, I think first of all, you know, if you, if you think about the biblical revelation, God's revealed himself in the heavens, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. God has revealed himself in the human conscience, Romans chapter 2. Uh, God has revealed himself in the history of Israel and in the incarnation of Christ. And what I think is interesting there is notice how the traditional arguments for God's existence connect to those areas. I mean, when we think about the heavens declaring the glory of God, we think about the Kalam cosmological argument. We think about the contingency argument. When it comes to the moral conscience, we have the moral argument. So. I find it difficult to believe that God has failed to adequately reveal himself. Now, if I come back at it from, from a kind of Pascalian point of view, Pascal says that we actually begin with the heart rather than with the head. And, you know, Paul in, in Romans 1 says that people, the natural disposition of the human being, given that they're fallen, is to suppress the truth of God. You know, I think... I think that there is indeed that natural tendency. And, and I think you could add other things. I mean, uh, I don't know that if God uh, revealed himself so demonstrably, it might coerce people. Pascal has a great line in the, in the Pensees. He says that, you know, there is enough evidence for those who are open and are seeking, but there's enough ambiguity for people who want to deny. So, I mean, when I think of the incarnation, I was thinking of the incarnation today because the, the, uh, the priest at my church, I go to an Anglican church, the priest said that, the, the, that Pentecost was every bit as important as the incarnation. And I thought to myself, wow, from a biblical point of view, God really has unfolded. He has really unveiled himself. So I find it hard to believe that, uh, and, and, uh, 
Schellenberg uses non-resistant non-belief. Um, oh, right. I think the Bible would say, no, um, people are very resistant to God. So I, I kind of see that. Uh, by the way, Schellenberg says he thinks that this hiddenness of God issue may be more formidable than the problem of evil. I was a little bit surprised because the problem of evil is a perennial challenge. But yeah. uh, I just, I've written recently three blog articles kind of responding to the hiddenness account. Hmm. To check those out. Hmm. Yeah. I've also thought too, when I think about that problem or that claim of, well, if God really existed, you, you, we wouldn't need arguments. I kind of think to myself, taking a kind of a card out of Hitchens deck, remember Hitchens was always really, he was always very fond of saying, oh, do you know the mind of God? Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. And, and um, I would want to say to them, well, do, do you know the mind of God? Because God could very well have very good reasons for setting up the universe in such a way that arguments are, uh, I don't want to say necessary, but arguments are something that can be used in order for people to you know, grope after him as Axe says, you know, so. I completely agree. In fact, one philosopher said um, that there may be as many as 150 different kinds of arguments. Now, let me let me clarify wow. that. These aren't 150 different, completely different, but they're varieties of the cosmological, varieties of the moral, varieties of the ontological. But one philosopher said there may be as many as 150 arguments in which uh, scholars in various disciplines take seriously. I mean, that's a lot of argument. Mm. Well, I, I tend to think when it comes to the hiddenness question is that, you know, the Bible does talk about God hiding himself. He's a God who hides himself and that those who seek him will find him. And when someone says that they are... Um, Hey, I'm not opposing. Um, I just wonder just how, then how much uh, urgency is there? Uh, you tried and you didn't find him. And I kind of always think of, uh, you know, if you had a child that was lost in the forest or something and uh, you went looking for them, you, you wouldn't like, well, I can't find him. Uh, I guess <laughs> he's not, he's gone. You know, you would, you'd, you'd search and search and search and they'd say, well, you're not going to find the kid. It's, it's, he's been gone too long. I will never stop looking, you know? So it's that, what, where's the person coming from? And if they say, um, well, I'm not resist, I'm not a resistant person. Uh, I just press them on that. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. <laughs> yes, you are. No, I'm not. <laughs> well, you sound pretty resistant to me. Um, I, I jest there, but <laughs> I, I, uh, the hiddenness of God question fascinates me in the sense of it being an objection when the whole point is that, you know, there's an element of seeking there that um, it just, it, it makes me very skeptical of, of the skeptic in that sense. Um, yeah. I, I'd have to analyze it case by case, but. I think too, um, you know, one of the diabolical things about being a sinner is it blinds you. You may, you may mm -hmm. not be aware that you're resisting. And, you know, you raise an interesting point, Brian, because the Bible does talk about a hiddenness. I think sometimes Christians, I mean, I, I think I would fit into the category. There have been times where I thought, Lord, why, why, do, why don't I sense your presence more? Why, why do you seem to be absent and I'm hurting and I'm seeking you? Of course, I think there it could be that uh, I have to come to God on his terms, not mine. Maybe I need to repent. Mm -hmm. And I and I think a, I think a lot of times that um, you know when we think about God's infinity, humans are finite creatures. We we can never fully get our minds around God's existence. So it could be that some of the hiddenness, both for the Christian and the non-Christian, could have to do with his his infinity and our finitude. Well, we'll talk a bit a bit more about the first part, and then there you talk about how there's often an objection about faith and belief being uh, opposed to one another, faith and reason being at odds. But you talk about historically Christianity relates faith to reason, and you go into detail about that. You, you, we've talked about uh, classical Christian thinkers in the past, mm -hmm. but talk a, if you would just unpack a little bit how you see Christianity being uh, very open to thought, open to science, yeah. open to reason. 
and so forth. Yes. Uh, well, I, I think a lot. I, I have the great privilege of meeting a lot of scientists because of my work at Reasons to Believe. And I will often ask them, why does science work? Why has why has the natural sciences been so successful in developing technology and medicine and these remarkable benefits that we all derive from it? Uh, and a lot of times I discover that the scientists that I encounter, they are highly specialized in their specific field, either in physics or a biology or wh whatever it may be. And what's interesting, Brian and Chad, is a lot of times they don't know a lot about the history of science or the philosophy of science. So they don't know, for example, how science began once in Christian Europe in the 17th century and how the Christian worldview shaped the presuppositions that go into it. I also meet scientists who, who think, mistakenly, but they think it, that uh, science has no connection to worldview beliefs. If you just practice science properly, it just works. And I say, no, that's not the case. You have to have a world that's conducive to science. It has to be a world that really exists, unlike Hinduism. It has to have patterns and regularity. Humans have to have cognitive faculties and sensory organs to track the intelligibility. Math and logic have to work. So you have to have three things to do science, a, a world that's conducive to science, human beings that have faculties that can connect with it, and the congruence between it, our logic and things of that nature. So what I like to do is I say, look, I think Christianity is a very intellectually robust religion. Um, mm -hmm. I think the worldview uh, helped to birth science. I think you see it in the, uh, the starting points or the philosophical presuppositions of science. You see it in all of the founding fathers, virtually to a person, either being Christian or Jewish, being theistic in orientation. But you also see it in other areas. I uh, have been using a logic textbook a long time. In fact, it was the textbook that my professor taught me from. Uh, it's entitled A Concise Introduction to Logic. And the author, Pat Hurley, he had an interesting section in the book. He has a list of 10 eminent logicians. And I thought, oh, I'm interested because I'm interested in the history of logic. Of course, the first one was Aristotle, the father of logic. But, you know, of the 10, six of them were Christian. So one of the things I say in the book is if Christianity really is anti-intellectual, if Christianity, if there is a fundamental uh, dissonance between reason and faith, why have so many of history's greatest thinkers in the most intellectually robust fields been Christian? So you have it in logic, you have it in philosophy, you have it in science. So I'm, I'm relying there a little bit on history and uh, on philosophy. But I would also say that, you know, if you take a definition of faith that I think is kind of standard in historic Christianity, I think it I think largely it comes from Augustine, but it's in Anselm, uh, and, it, and it's seen in a variety of people, that, that faith is confident trust in a, in a reliable source. So the pistuo believe, the Greek word, pistis, the noun, the core of that word is trust. But in a Christian context, it's never blind trust. It's confident trust in a reliable source. That reliable source can be God. It can be Christ. It could be your parents. It could be your teachers. It could be the chair I'm, I'm sitting in right now. So if that is a, a definition that has largely been accepted by Christian thinkers and philosophers, notice that the very definition of faith involves reason. Confident trust in a reliable source. Not blind faith. And, and in terms of Christianity, to be a Christian, you have to have knowledge. You have to have a knowledge about Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. So the Christian faith involves knowledge. It seems compatible with reason. You know, the, the uh, four horsemen of the new atheism like to, like to talk about kind of 
anti-intellectualism. And unfortunately, there is anti-intellectualism in parts of our churches, but that's never been the consensus. Uh, Augustine would talk about, for example, um, faith-seeking understanding. I can't fully get my mind around the Trinity or the Incarnation or the Atonement, but that doesn't mean that I can't have a good understanding of those things. And, and maybe I can look a little deeper, as you mentioned, Brian, earlier. Uh, when I became a Christian, I don't think I came based upon an argument. I think I came out of need. But almost immediately, apologetics became necessary because a Jehovah's Witness knocked at the door and told me everything I believed was wrong. So I had to dig in and get back to it. I, I think, uh, I mean, if you look at, uh, I, I asked Peter Atkins when I was in London, uh, Peter uh, debated Hugh Ross, and we were kind of in the, in the studio kind of chatting before. And um, uh, Peter says, well, you know, do you, I, I mentioned um, I mentioned one of the Oxford Swinburne. I mentioned Swinburne. I said, "Do you know Richard Swinburne?" He goes, "Yeah." He says, "Do you agree with everything Swinburne says?" I says, "Well, I don't agree with everything he says, but I I think he is a really an outstanding philosopher." So I then ask him, "Do you agree with everything Richard Dawkins says?" He says, "Yeah, I, I never disagree with Dawkins." I thought, "Well, who's the critical thinker here?" Wow. Um, you know, you look at the you look at the world in which we live. I mean. Alvin Plantica, Richard Swinburne, William Lane Craig. Then you look at Jim Tour in science. There are a lot of very cerebral Christian thinkers in every discipline. I don't think Christianity lacks careful thought. Now, again, there, there, are, there are segments of the church and, and in the past that have been anti-intellectual, but I think that's a misunderstanding to some degree. Um, one of the resources I would want to commend to listeners, as Brian has mentioned, uh, 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 Ken's book, Classical Christian Thinkers, but on reasons.org, uh, actually on his blog, uh, you can find a series that he did called Christian Thinkers 101. And uh, you can kind of get a taste of what he's talking about, of, of some of the great minds in the, from the very inception of uh, Christendom. And uh, so they're just nice, short, concise blog posts that are really helpful to kind of get a flavor of that. One of the things you do in the book that I really appreciated, uh, I would love to see more uh, Christian thinkers do this, is that you, you ask the question, is, are the mysteries in Christianity just logical you know, contradictions? And you are very forthright with the fact that there are, there are mysteries. Uh, and that we shouldn't be, it's nothing we, we should be ashamed of. It's nothing we should uh, kind of uh, kind of hide from. Uh, but I was wondering, one of the struggling, one of the things that people, most people struggle with is the idea of the Trinity. And uh, I just thought to myself, I wonder what you would say if you were in a conversation with somebody. And they mentioned to you, why, you know, what do you mean three and one? This, this doesn't make sense to me. We've talked in the podcast before about how the Trinity is not something we can completely explain, but we can offer reasons as to why it's rational, you know, or reasonable. Uh, what would you, first of all, what would you say to somebody who claimed it was a logical contradiction? And then what would you give them to kind of um, put their, you know, to bite on, to, to kind of give them an idea of why this is something that can be reasonably believed, even if it can't be completely understood? Yeah, I, I, I love the Trinity. I have to tell you that um, the Trinity, when I think about the Trinity, I think about God is analogous to a loving family. And I mean, one of the things I do with Muslims and Jews and Jehovah's Witnesses is I ask them because they have a, the Unitarian view of God, one God, one person. I say, who did your God love in eternity before he created human beings and angels? And was he alone? Was he lonely? Did he have to create? By the way, I've spent a good bit of my adult life talking with Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. When I bring out the issue of love, it changes the whole discourse. So 
instead of saying the Bible teaches the Trinity and they say, no, it doesn't. And I say, yes, it does. And they say, no, it doesn't. And I say, yes, it does. I say to them, well, who did Jehovah love in eternity before he created angels and men? And I recently talked to a Muslim about this. He goes, you know, I don't, I, I can't answer your question. I said, that's all right. Go talk to your imam. See if, see what you're, and he brought his imam and I had a, a detailed back and forth. All of that, Chad, to say, I love the Trinity because I know that God is perfectly loving and that when he creates, that love spills on over to me. And uh, I know that God is love. I know that God is perfect in himself. And that is, I feel what, I think what Lewis would say when he said that uh, you feel the joy of the Lord. When I think about the Trinity, I feel a deep sense of joy. Now, what about how we think about it. Well, you know, when people say that mysteries are contradictions, I say, well, let's be real clear about what a contradiction is. A contradiction is two statements that negate or deny one another. So if you define the Trinity as God is one and not one, three and not three, then that is a contradiction. But that's not what Christians say. The, the creeds say that the way in which God is one, his essence or being, is in a different category than the way he is three. Or what my friend J.P. Moreland would say, God is one what and three who's. And so, no, I can't get my mind around the Trinity. Uh, I think everything about God is mysterious because he's infinite and eternal, and I'm finite and temporal. So I'm never going to be able to exhaustively understand him. But you can state the Trinity in a way that eludes logical contradiction. And I think there are plenty of areas in which you have unity and diversity. I mean, the universe, uh, the, the word universe, unity and diversity. A triangle has three sides. It's, it's a single triangle with three sides. So I don't think that oneness and threeness are necessarily a contradiction. And I think there are ways of kind of unpackaging. Now, you do hit a limit, obviously, because of our finitude. But I like to uh, I like to talk about some of the analogies. And I, again, St. Augustine's one of my favorite Christian thinkers. He was very positive about using analogies. Some people are not. Some people think any analogy is going to be a false analogy because it doesn't apply to, to God. I'm a little more cavalier with Augustine. And, and <laughs> what I will often tell people is, what do you think about a God where the Father loves the Son in the Spirit from all eternity? God can be a perfect being, perfect in holiness, perfect in wisdom, and perfect in love. But if he's a single solitary God, is his love narcissism? Is he desperate? I think the Trinity, even though it is very difficult to unpackage various elements, I think it's one of the most dynamic teachings of Christianity. And, and at the end of the day, when I think about the Father, Son, and the Spirit, I feel a deep sense of joy. Mm -hmm. I love the Trinity. Yeah, excellent. Well, Ken, I have one more question in our section about, is it true? And uh, we're kind of going on different routes and paths that I'm really enjoying. And so I'm going to throw another one in there. And that is, uh, we talked about a cumulative case and we've talked about the different there are all these different arguments that you do mention in the book about does god exist but when it comes to the topic is christianity true or if you're saying is a christianity true of course some people would say well first you need to build up from the bottom to have first you have to have reasons to believe god exists and then show credibility of the uh, historical records and then show the resurrection etc. So I'm wondering um, what your thoughts are on an approach to speaking to people, um, not from a philosophical point of view of what is required to build your worldview on, you know, the prerequisites, well, uh, worldview wise. But when you're in a conversation, where would you start, Ken? Would you start with talking about Jesus and then you know, about, um, you know, your experiences? Would you um, you know, if you wanted to show that it's true, would you could you start with the cross? Would you start with the Gospels? 
Or would you say, well, briefly, you know, God, you know, I have there's good reasons to believe God exists and then and that Jesus is, the, is uh, you know, God's son. And then let them ask, you know, what would be your yeah. general approach, you know, in a, in a standard, you know, grab bag sort of conversation you might have with someone that makes sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Um, and of course, Christians have differing ideas about apologetic methodology. I mean, uh, Greg Bonson, a presuppositional philosopher, was a friend of mine. And Walter Martin, um, John Warwick Montgomery, they were very strongly evidential. And then uh, uh, Norm Geisler takes a very classical Thomistic approach. My way of thinking about that is I think that arguments are kind of like personality. I, I'm not real strict about insisting that apologetics has to be done in a particular way. But I, I think, Brian, I mean, if I were meeting somebody for the first time, I, I might try to discern where is this person coming from? What, what, what issues are at stake here? Is, is this a person who is searching is this a person who is, you know, is wondering what what is the meaning of life, or or do they want to engage in a philosophical conversations, or maybe they're a real science, you know, they're they're strongly into the area of science. I would try to kind of discern where they're coming from, but in for me, an area that again I'm very comfortable with is in my family. My parents were evangelicals. My dad was a World War II veteran, came back from World War II. Uh, he was in Rome when Rome was liberated in 1944, walked into the Vatican. And you can imagine a West Virginia boy walking into the Vatican, you know, seats 65,000 people. Catholicism had an influence on my dad. So we converted to Catholicism when I was a four-year-old in the in the early 1960s. So. Uh, my family kind of fell away from their Catholicism. We only went to Mass, you know, on Easter and Christmas. But I had a brother, an older brother, who um, was kind of a hippie. He was into the countercultural movement. Unfortunately, my brother became addicted to narcotics. It affected his psychological state, and um, my brother ended up taking his own life. And I remember being a 19-year-old, and I'd never had anybody close to me die. And I thought, wow, uh, I, I, felt, I felt survivor's guilt. I felt like, wow, I, I, didn't even, I don't even have enough answers in my life to give my brother who was searching. Uh, so when my sister gave me a copy of Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, I didn't, I didn't read it right away. But when I began reading it, I thought, wow, I didn't know that Christians could be this careful in their thinking. I didn't know, I didn't, C.S. Lewis introduced the life of the mind to me. I had to go to my dictionary. What does he mean by this word? What does he mean by that word? But I came to faith, not in the absence of arguments, but when I was told and it was explained to me who Jesus was and what he had come to do, that he was the son of God and that his death somehow reconciled me to God. I knew that that's what I needed. I knew that's what I wanted. So there may be times with certain individuals, it may not be necessary to present a specific argument, but because we now live in a world where it's the world is very small, where you, I mean, now in Los Angeles, for example, uh, where the RTB office is, reasons to believe, I mean, you've got Muslims, you've got Hindus, you've got Buddhists, Taoists, you, you have people from all walks of life. Maybe apologetics takes on a greater dimension in that kind of, kind of context. But again, I'm, I, if somebody wants to look at the traditional arguments for God, I think that there are forms of the uh, cosmological, teleological, moral, and even ontological arguments that I think are valid. Uh, we see them presented historically in among the great Christian thinkers, but there are philosophers today who are willing to defend those arguments. Yet, I would say for me, I find Jesus to be extraordinarily persuasive. 
when I read through the Gospels, I, I kind of did think to myself, well, what are my options here? It, could, he be, uh, could he be a myth? And I, I find Lewis's engagement pretty powerful. Lewis and Tolkien, they're kind of the experts on mythology and legend. And Lewis says the Gospels are not framed in a legendary context. So I say, okay, well, if he's not a myth, uh, what are my options? Could Jesus uh, have been a lunatic or a liar? Based upon what I, you know, you know, if, if the apostles made up the Gospels, they're better than Lewis and Tolkien. Uh, it's the greatest story ever told. So I kind of went through a, a, an abductive uh, process. You know, is he... If he's not a myth, if he is, uh, you know, not a liar, I did go through that process. Now, some people would say, well, you know, maybe it's a false dichotomy. You haven't considered all alternatives. I think I've considered a lot of alternatives. So I'm very comfortable introducing people to Jesus. But I, I do try to, I try to detect, I try to discern where they're coming from. What, what is their need? What, what area kind of stands in the way? and as I've mentioned, I love the abductive approach because I just think that's a natural way of reasoning. What, what philosophy of life tends to explain the world, myself, and the things I encounter in life? And so, again, I'm kind of an abductive type of person, but I'm not afraid to uh, take on the other areas if, if somebody thinks those are worthy of consideration. All right. Well, thank you. That's been very helpful. Now, for those who are listening, we're reaching the end of part one of our interview with Ken Samples. We want to encourage you to go to RTB, uh, Reasons to Believe. Uh, you can find that at reasons.org where you find Ken's resources. We want to point you to his newest book, which is Christianity Cross-Examined. Join us next week for the second part of this interview. We're going to be talking about uh, more along the lines of, is Christianity good? So I hope you join us for that. Thanks for joining us today, Ken. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, pleasure to talk with both of you. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you have a question you'd like us to address or just a message for us, feedback, good or bad, you can either email us at podcast at apologetics315.com or leave a voice message for us using SpeakPipe. Just go to speakpipe.com slash apologetics315 to leave us a message. And remember, if you include a Ghostbusters quote in your question, we guarantee that we'll read it on the podcast. And we also ensure up to 50% better quality answers. Also, if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave a review in iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice. And please share this episode with a friend if you found it useful. Remember, you can find lots of apologetics resources at apologetics315.com, along with show notes for today's episode. Find Chad's apologetic stuff over at Truth Bomb Apologetics. That's truthbomb.blogspot.com. This has been Brian Auten and Chad Gross for the Apologetics 315 podcast, and thanks for listening. We're momentarily taking over your favorite music station to deliver an important message from Polliner Grapefruit Rather Radio. What favorites do you rock in your summer mix? Do you have tracks that sound like this? Or something like this? Or perhaps this? Now, regardless of what your music mix sounds like, just make sure you cue this up. Sound good? That's a refreshing grapefruit rattler. It's the perfect mashup of German lager and grapefruit, meant to be a part of your summer mix. And now, by following Polliner USA on Instagram, you'll have the chance to win summer music prizes. Just look for the Polliner Grapefruit Rattler music post and play the fun trivia game. Correct answers are how you enter. Cue the legal stuff. Polling USA, White Plains, New York. No purchase necessary. Open to U.S. residents 21 or older, excluding West Virginia. In 73021. Void where prohibited. See rockthemix.com for complete rules. Hashtag beer goals. We now return you to your regularly scheduled station. Streaming only on Peacock. John Wayne Gacy killed 32. Straight from the killer's mouth. They want you to believe that I alone committed these murders. The new gripping six-part documentary series. John Wayne Gacy, Devil in Disguise. All episodes streaming now. Only on Peacock.